Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids and cubs, and welcome to season three and episode number 341 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Shadoop, 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 yeah, yeah. I'm your host. The eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A. And with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly, looking absolutely wonderful in red today. Thank you. You're actually the liberal, and I'm the conservative today. (laughs) 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 Red red and blue. Uh, That'll be my most demanding acting job ever, kids and cops. Yes. Me as a conservative. Um, <laughs> a big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com, who have been with us since the very, very beginning. Thank you so very much. We appreciate everything that you do for us. It's going to be a lovely day here at the Beaver Lodge. Um, renovation day got delayed yesterday. Uh, we received a call. Uh, saying that they weren't quite finished where they were before, so they were coming today, absolutely for sure. That, that, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll believe it when it starts because we heard that a couple of times with our heat pump too. And you know what? You can't even get mad at them. You you really can't. No. People are just stretched so thin right now in all trades. There's just simply more work than there are bodies to fill positions, and and train bodies to fill positions. You can yeah, hire absolutely. just anybody, but if they don't know how to do the job, they're no damn good here, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you don't want to leave the job that you're doing, you know, exactly. 90% done. No, no, no. Finish That's it up cool. properly so that when you start the next one, it's behind you. You don't have to worry about it and the client's satisfied. So. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Look, I've been on that. I've been in that game where I'm sorry, I just can't get to you till next week. I'm just bogged down with work. I've got too much. I'm waiting on parts. It's, you know. People are pretty understanding for the most part. Every now and then you'll have somebody who'll just lose their mind. It's like, okay, well, you know, I'm firing you as a client. (laughs) And I've done that before. Yes. Yes. And you have to do it sometimes. You said, yeah, no, I don't, I'm not doing business with you anymore. What do you mean? Well, you treat me like dirt and you don't listen to reason and you don't seem to understand how the world works. So uh, we can't do business anymore. Yep. Some business I just do not want. Yeah. Yeah. If the headache is worth is bigger than the the pay, then it ain't worth it. And I mean, even sometimes, sometimes I've walked away from contracts where I'm like, yeah, I don't need this hassle. Sure. The money's good, but the, the stress level that gets induced from it is uh, not worth the money that you're paying me. So. Yep. Indeed. Indeed. All right. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health today, sir? Um, I think it's, I think it's pretty good today. Uh, it's not, not great. Uh, I got to take medication too before I leave. I forgot. I'm, um, uh, I wasn't feeling wonderful yesterday. I mean, I got through the work day, but as the day went on, I started getting a violent migraine and I think 
uh, in all honesty, I think it had to do with the pressure system because the, the pressure system changed and it, it was all sinus, like right across the front. So it's like I took uh, an antihistamine, which helped for, you know, decongest and relieve some sinus pressure. And that felt a little bit better after a while, but I was just wiped out, exhausted. I think combination of the weekend and uh, just, uh, you know, a million things going on in my life can, can make you a little tired sometimes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got a couple of things, but if you've got something to start to, with today, I have no problem handing it over. Well, I, I started to talk about how Kevin O'Leary is just, well, I remember him being Mr. Wonderful, and he was rather abrasive on uh, Dragon's Den from time to time. And yeah. uh, the very Wonderful last... Episode, seems like it was uh, compensating and doing a lot of heavy lifting in those sentences. Yeah. Well, the, the very last episode he was on... Uh, everybody just, uh, the last episode he was on, I remember it very clearly because you could see the look on his face of, oh, I'm an asshole. I'm defeated. And it was time for him to go. And it was when they had a, a group of kids from Halifax, from a, a community school in Halifax that started making sauces from the vegetables they were growing in the garden, like pepper sauces and hot sauces. And all the dragons were like, this is wonderful. You're, you're learning how to garden. You're learning how to make your own food. You're learning how to conduct a business everybody was in except for him he's like no i don't see this just a bunch of kids i'm out and you could see all the other dragons were all we're all in we're all in we're all in so they all put a whole bunch of money into it and helped out and they're all joyous and you, and you camera pans over to him and you see this look of utter defeat on his face like yeah my ego got the best of me i was being an asshole and sometimes you should just do a good thing because good things need to be done it was his last episode it was time for him to go now when he was running to be the conservative leader. Uh, what's her name from the show whose name I'm escaping? Um, I see her right now, red hair. Um, uh, lost your feed. Arlene? Pardon? Arlene Dickinson or something? Yes, thank you, Arlene Dickinson. Is? She came out and said, do not elect this man leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. She said, I know him. He's a good businessman. He's a smart businessman. He is not a politician. He should not be in that position. He will do harm to this country. And this is a woman who's made a ton of money. But she also had hard times. Now, he had hard times when he first started out, but I think he's lost touch with that. And he's kind of become a bit of an arse over the last few years. And he defended Trump and defended Trump's uh, saying that he can, you know, do whatever he wants, basically. So it's just, just dude, your, your ego is getting the better of you. It's time to step out of the spotlight because each time you get on television, you just open your mouth and say something stupider each time every single time and all you're doing is sinking your own reputation if there's anything left of it i think people are only dealing with you because you still got money mm. if you were a poor schlub like me nobody would talk to you mm. right mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i could see that yeah i think he's one of those uh um money people who decided that he was going where he thought the money was going to be mm -hmm. which is in the in that movement yep and uh, I mean, there's always going to be money in that movement, but the problem is, is that you got to fly so close to the sun when you're in that movement that, you know, if you melt your wings, oopsie, right. As uh, Donald Trump is uh, learning, the it seems, way. yeah, well, the hard way, because it's, uh, well, number one, it seems he defamed Eugene Carroll yet one more time. So mm -hmm. it's sort of like, um, yeah, it was, everybody say like the big discussion is like whether or not she's going to sue me on technically. If it was me, I would. I would have like, with the money I got so far, I would have like one person hired to monitor all media. And every time he opens his mouth about me, I would just sue him again because yeah. I've won twice already. It's literally, at this point, it's just easy money. Well, nobody will put up the bond for the $450 million he owes her. Well, that's the exact, well, he does not the money that he just owes her. That's the money that he owes her, I believe. Uh, and then the money from the settlement right. from the Trump organization thing, which was like over $350 million. But he says he's worth $2 billion, but he can't come up with $450 million? Yeah, he cannot come up with it. Apparently, there was uh, some uh, company that was uh, uh, willing to pay the bond or something like that, or said that they were willing to pay the bond, but they had some connections to Russia somehow. So I'm not sure if that uh, was able to go th was able to go through or not. Uh, I, I assume that the court can uh, every now and then say, uh, no, you can't get the bond there. Um, 
I would assume. So yes, he does seem to have uh, trouble securing his bond um, to, co to cover the $450 million. He's trying to, in court, to try to have the size of the bond uh, reduced, right? So that's not that fair. Mm. The purpose for that is so that he can stay out of jail pending appeal. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, it's his problem seems to be that he hasn't been able to find a financial institution that is reputable that will consider his real estate holdings as collateral. Mm. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that you just lost a court, court case about overvaluing everything you own. Well, and now you got to use the stuff that you own to go and get some money to keep your ass out of jail. People say, well, didn't you just lose a court case saying that what you own is actually overvalued and we don't actually know and that you're kind of a big risk and you lie about these things? So, um, no, sorry, um, we're closed. <laughs> you know, when you walked in, you know, it's like that moment. Like it's like it's, you know, the store closes at five o'clock, and it's like four fifty-eight, and you're oh. running to the store, and they got that little sign, and they, they just as you get to the door, they turn it and smile. Sorry, we're closed. <laughs> it's like no, I need to go me elbow. Ah. <laughs> My kid's gonna kill me. Ah. Well, you know, uh, 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 lack of planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on mine. Right? <laughs> I need that for my kid. Well, maybe you should have got here earlier. <laughs> Please. <laughs> and they pull down the curtain. <laughs> they draw the blinds. Sorry. Yeah, so he's, he's out of money. He's out of luck. He's uh, being sued into oblivion. Uh, he said that he should have absolute immunity, no matter what. Oh, and he, he always says promised, that. He promised a bloodbath in November if he doesn't get elected. This this man is not playing with a full deck. So a typical Monday. Yeah, 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 basically, yeah. Yeah. Give me what I want or I'll trash the entire place. Ah. I, Give me I another see. cheeseburger. I see, a, I see a couple of things floating around right now online, and I'm like, I don't even know what to say about that. Jan Arden is trending because she wants to become the leader of the NDP as well, apparently. And white conservative More men power really to don't it. like that. <laughs> they really hey, well, don't wait like a minute. That. She wants. She's a woman mm -hmm. and an artist at mm -hmm. the same time, <laughs> and a woman of size. Yes, who wants to become leader of the, ooh, ye, ah. <laughs> well, yeah. and I have some personal I issues. can see how conservative men would have a problem with that. I like Jan's music and I like her, her acting. She's quite funny, but I have some personal issues with her um, from an incident a couple of years ago where uh, I asked her to try and use her platform to highlight the fact that people were dying in long-term care homes and one of her friend's supporters said, yeah, but why isn't the prime minister doing anything about sending horses to Europe for food? I'm like... We have seniors dying in retirement homes in Ontario because Doug Ford isn't doing a damn thing and you're more concerned about forces being used for a source of sustenance for other human beings. Like it or not, people are getting fed. I think people should come before horses, but that's just me. So I got blocked by Jan for saying that. Hmm. So, you know, well, and, and there's also this little tidbit from a few years ago. I'll, I'll put it on the screen. You decide whether you want to read it or not, sir. I don't know. I don't know if I want to read that. Three years Jeez. apart. Yeah. May 09, yeah. she said something pretty yeah. pretty bad, and then three years later, she said something pretty bad, too. Yeah, the tarred word. Yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, like, now the first one I can understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What's but then the second one? Three years later, she turns around and uses it as a derogatory term. Yeah. The first one is her talking about the word having been used against her. In 1968. By 1968. Her teacher. Yes. And the other one is her actually using it in 2012. Yeah. To describe somebody's glasses. So it's like, yeah. Jan, no. No. And here's the thing, Jan. You've been on but Twitter the, a long there, time. The, but there's the proof why this is why we do not do purity tests. Yes. Because everybody's human and every, it's like that song that everybody have in UQ. Everyone is just a little bit racist sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah. Everybody has a bad moment where they go down into the well 
And they pick out a word that they really shouldn't. And use it at the wrong and time. use it at the wrong time. And when you do it on the internet, it's forever. Yep. Oh, and I've done it too. I've made mistakes like oh, that. Oh, God, I yes. I fully own it though. I go, yeah, I said that. People are like, oh, oh I'm not denying it. It's right there in front of you. You can see it, can't you? Yeah, I said it. And I meant it at the time because I was angry because a person was harassing me. So I lashed out. Okay, and what are you going to do? I'm proud about? of it now, but... What are you going to do about it? I'm not going to do a damn thing about it. It's there forever. I said it. I did it. I I don't regret it. it wasn't was it too moment. harsh? Yes. Was it wrong? Yes. But I said it. It's there. I can't take it back. I can't erase it. And I'm not going to try and hide from something I did if I did it. I own my mistakes. That's what a real man does. That's what a real woman does. That's what a real adult does. Man, woman, he, she, they, he, him, her, zezer. You own your mistakes when you make them. You own them. That's it. It's not complicated. I made a mistake. I own it. And sometimes I apologize. And sometimes I don't because I might still stand behind what I said, even if it was harsh. Especially when somebody is coming to harm you. I mean... Yep. It's as simple as that. Yep, yep, indeed, indeed. Um, the big bombshell, mm -hmm. if one would consider it a bombshell, uh, came from provincial politics yesterday, Ontario provincial politics, where the leader of the Ontario Liberal Party, Bonnie Crombie, who still mm -hmm. doesn't yet have a seat, but I don't think that that's such a big deal as a lot of people think it is, at the moment, given that we're, what, still about three years out yes. from a provincial election or something of the sort. Um, it is three, isn't it? I, I believe so. I think it's still about three. Or maybe it's it was, two. We're, 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 yeah, we might be closing in on two in, in yeah, we, June. Yes, you're right. Yeah, in this, June it will be two. <clears throat> that's correct. So still greater than two. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's plenty of time for that. And, uh, but she... Um, came out and had uh, took a position on climate change uh, and carbon pricing. And it seems that her position is that she will not be using an Ontario carbon tax as a solution. So she will now, of course, when we say carbon tax, that's a short form for carbon regulatory fee. Right. Just like when we say payroll taxes for EI and CPP, they're really deductions. Mm -hmm. They're really insurance premium contributions. But we say tax because it's a shortcut. So yeah, that's for all the pedantic point. people out there that keep on saying, oh, well, people say it's a tax. It's not actually a tax. It's a regulatory fee, which is why it was considered constitutional at the Supreme Court level. And it operates like a regulatory fee Correct. as well. So in Canada... If you happen to be living in one of the jurisdictions where the federal backstop applies, and when this carbon pricing started, it was only applying in a few provinces, and then for some reason, a certain number of Atlantic Canadian provinces decided that the programs that they had before that were compliant, the in-province programs, they weren't going to run anymore. Doug Ford came along and destroyed cap and trade. So if you live in Newfoundland and Labrador, where Premier Fury is making uh, joining the other six conservative uh, premiers, as uh, someone pointed out after Danielle Smith said, a whole bunch of premiers from a wide variety of perspectives. No, it's six conservative premiers yeah. and one in Newfoundland and Labrador, <laughs> who happens to be variety. not of your <laughs> persuasion. Yeah. Right. Uh, but then the government of Nova Scotia also had a proper plan and decided they were not doing it. And the government of Ontario had a proper plan and decided they're not doing it. So if you live in those three provinces and you weren't paying it at the beginning, but you are now, you have your provincial premier to thank for this and a lot of provincial premiers don't want to take the heat from that and don't want to take on the cost or the responsibility of doing it particularly for example in uh, ontario and in alberta who uh, recently uh, presented a well, i'm not sure if ontario's presented its budget for this year yet but alberta recently has tabled it and uh, with putting money aside into the heritage and savings trust which is something she's doing so that she doesn't have to pay people what their work when contract negotiations come along they're still reporting an over 300 million dollar surplus and 
as a premier who has the power of legislation and the power of directing money, she is not choosing to help her own citizens with her own money. She was coming cap in hand to Ottawa with her hands up, mm -hmm. like she's living at the Palm View Motel again, saying, yeah. Ottawa, can I have money? to alleviate the affordability crisis, even though I could do it myself, but I choose not to. Ottawa, can I have money? Uh, can you reduce your carbon tax increase, which is 0 0.3 cents a liter or a little less, because on a per liter of gas or something, uh, while she's raising the provincial gas tax by 13 cents? She could not raise the provincial gas tax. Mm-hmm. Or she could raise it by only nine cents and thus negate the effect of the rising government. But, but she chooses not to do that. It, it's Ottawa's problem. Ottawa must fix her problem. Yeah. All these premiers have the choice to use their own money or use their own power of legislation or cut their own gas taxes or mm -hmm. any other tax somewhere else in the economy in order to save you an equivalent amount of money. Or just write you a check like New Brunswick tried to do, or like Saskatchewan did before, Quebec did before, Alberta did before during the affordability, during the worst of COVID and the affordability crisis. They have all these choices, but they're not. They want all the money to come from Ottawa. They want all the effort to come from Ottawa. And they want to blame Ottawa when it doesn't work. But that's all because they're too lazy to do the bare minimum, which is establish a program in province where the money would stay in province. For example, British Columbia charges the carbon tax. British Columbia offers a rebate of this carbon tax to its citizens. Quebec has a cap and trade system. So therefore there is no rebate because nobody's charged it at source as a tax. Of course, it's embedded into the price. All the other provinces have decided Hey, no, it's just easier to let the federal government do it, which is a, a valid decision. If bureaucracy, you don't want to create another bureaucracy, you say, no, we'll just take the federal bop stop. Thank you very much. But provinces like Saskatchewan who say they want the rebate anyway, well, if there was a Saskatchewan carbon tax, the government of Saskatchewan could collect that money and decides to either redistribute to its citizens mm -hmm. or not, or not, and spend it on just direct all the money on carbon stuff. But these are choices the provinces have and choices that the provinces are not making because they don't want to do the work. So it appears that Bonnie Crombie is saying that she will have a suite of measures, that she will take it seriously, but one of them will not be an Ontario carbon tax to replace the federal backstop. So I don't know if it's a return to cap and trade that she's got something planned. But it looks like she is going to take measures so that the federal carbon backstop no longer applies in Ontario, but none of them will be a carbon tax. Now, while this may, let me put it this way, a lot of people are either criticizing her very strongly, mm -hmm. carbon purists, and a lot of people are saying, you know, uh, calling this a brilliant move. Politically, it's a brilliant move mm -hmm. because there's absolutely no jurisdiction with the toxicity that the conservatives have added to the debate. There is, even though it is the right thing to do, even though it is the most conservative approach, even though it's one of the most efficient ways to do it with the least amount of bureaucracy, an actual carbon regulatory fee, it's been proven by most economists everywhere else that if you wanted to do it with the least disruption to the economy as fast as possible and get the most bag of your buck, you would have 100% of your carbon program almost being a carbon price. The federal government's doing about a third of it through that and a third through other initiatives, like, for example, helping people replace heat pumps and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, you can have an uh, in, in emissions cap on top of that, which is so when you put all the components together, Right. The federal government is getting there. It's a, it's going to, it looks like it is going to achieve its goal if it's able to put on all these uh, components. From the provincial government's perspective, you can do the same thing. So it looks like what Bonnie Crombie is going to do is avoid all discussion of carbon tax because everybody's going to ask her, well, you support the carbon tax, you support the carbon tax and put her on the back foot in the defense of the entire time. So she's just come out right now and said, no, there will be no carbon taxes. 
which means she's going to have to take other measures. Now, other measures are more expensive in terms of bang for your buck. So it costs more to achieve the same results. So, um, okay, now so financially and efficient and efficiency, it's not the smarter, it's not the smarter move, but you, it's not like you can be unsuccessful doing it other ways. It's just going to cost more. So we're in a situation now because one party and one political movement has got so many Canadians to hate the concept of paying at source for carbon that we have to now adopt a whole suite of a whole bunch of other measures that are least if less effective and cost more in order so that we can act on the problem and not call us a car not call it a carbon tax or carpet regulation fees so the conservatives are actually making it harder to do it and making it cost more so that's where you'll have the purists of the environmentalists say like this is terrible 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 it's not terrible, terrible, terrible. It's just not the most efficient and the most cost-effective way to do it. But it could still get done. Politically, however, given that you can't touch anything that says carbon regulation with a 10-foot pole and survive, it's very smart. And it's very smart that she's doing it this early because it kind of takes the issue off the table. So... She says, according to the Global Mail, she won't impose a provincial carbon tax if she wins the next election, as her party distanced itself from a federal policy that's also facing pushback from most premiers across the country. Ms. Crombie announced Monday that the provincial liberals, currently third place in the legislature, has launched an expert panel about climate action to lead consultations for the 2026 election platform. But for the first time since becoming leader earlier this year, she said the plan will not include a carbon tax. Ontario Premier Doug Ford has repeatedly attacked Ms. Crombie on the issue, calling her, quote, queen of the carbon tax because of her time as a Liberal MP from 2008 to 2011, when we didn't have it. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't a thing. <laughs> and alleging she would bring in a provincial pricing scheme if she were to form government. Of course, he alleged that based on absolutely nothing that she had said. Mm -hmm. So he just pulled that out of his ass. Well, uh, And again, place. when we're talking... We talk often about Doug Ford and abuser talk, right? Mm -hmm. Accuse someone of doing something that they have no intention of doing or that they would never do in order to put them on the defensive back foot and get them going, no, I wouldn't, trying to prove themselves to you. That's mm -hmm. abuser behavior. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's, don't, that's don't, abuser make behavior. don't make me. Like this. I'm, I'm going to put you, I'm just going to lie about you and I'm going to put you in the position of having, of being on the defensive to start with right off the bat. So she kind of pulled the rug out from under his feet on that one, which kind of makes me happy. That 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 alone is almost worth the price of admission. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Was I smirking and smiling evilly there? Sorry. Um, Maybe a little bit. I, 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 may, I may have enjoyed that a little much. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Crombie previously said she would study the issue, but not did not rule it out until this week. She did not specifically comment on the federal plan, which imposes consumer carbon pricing on provinces that do not implement their own pricing system, such as through a cap tax or cap and trade system. Quote, Ontario Liberals will have the most innovative, aggressive plan for climate action this province has ever seen, Ms. Crombie said in a video posted to social media on Monday. We will ensure major polluters pay, but our climate action plan will also save families money. Let me be very clear, a carbon tax will not be part of my plan. Instead, Ms. Crombie said she wants, quote, robust action on building public transit, investing in electric vehicle infrastructure, reforming land use planning, decarbonizing the energy grid, and helping homes become more energy efficient. The six-person panel will be chaired by Liberal MPP Mary Margaret McMahon, the party's environment critic. Ms. Crombie, who does not hold a seat in the legislature, did not do interviews on Monday, but members of her party told reporters at Queen's Park that the federal carbon pricing plan suffers from miscommunication. Quote, it hasn't been communicated clearly to people, and so at a time when people are feeling a lot of pressure, this has become the focus of the affordability crisis. And as uh, Chantal Hébert, uh, I think, recently said on an uh, issue, uh, I think the Liberals' problem on this is that they thought that the battle had been won because they already fought two elections on the carbon pricing and mm -hmm. won, and then fought all the premiums in court at the Supreme Court and won. So I guess they figured it was good enough. But yes, there is this program has been atrociously communicated. Atrociously communicated. And the yes. liberals only have themselves to blame. 
only have themselves. And this is not the first time they've done this. Oh, yes. Terrible comms, like terrible comms. Just, it just, just I, I don't know what's going on with that. Um, they have so many smart people working for them, so many smart members of parliament, so many smart cabinet members, but their comms division is just atrocious. Atrocious, atrocious. yeah. Uh, quote, they don't understand the purpose, the his sorry, the history of it, what it accomplishes, so we're looking at creating a great plan with a great group of people. Progressive conservatives called on Ms. Crombie to disavow the federal carbon pricing regime. Quote, what, what's her position on the federal carbon tax that the federal government is imposing on the people? It seems that her position is, is that we're going to create a provincial program that will meet the minimum criteria that the federal government is demanding so that the federal backstop doesn't apply in Ontario. Mm. It seems to me that that is her position, even though the conservatives, progressive conservatives, are pretending that they, they they just can't understand it. But again, they're pretending that they just can't understand money being collected and then rebated, even though the GST is a conservative principle where there's money collected and people get a GST rebate. Uh, well, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm just... Like, you opened the door, counselor. Mm. <laughs> it's literally the model you used for GST. Like, really? Well, you don't understand how rebates work? Okay, sure. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I'm sure you've yeah. seen the, uh, um, the, the the viral video that Sean Fraser made about Pierre Polyev, but have you seen the this uh, this scrap the crap right that uh, yeah Michel Ferrari kind of stepped in it <laughs> yesterday the crap? was it yesterday or the day before when uh, oh I can't find I'm trying to find the video it was like it was a thing of beauty where he just yells oh scrap the crap talking about how you need to do this, you need to do that. It's like you voted against funding for, uh, we gave uh, our military personnel a pay raise and you voted against it in December. Scrap the crap. It's like mm. they come out here and pontificating about how we should do more to help people, but you voted against every single measure of help to every single Canadian back in December when you tried to hold us over Christmas. You yep, duplicitous... Two faced lying conservatives are like that. It's like, oh, these poor people, they're going to food banks. Two million people, the federal government should do something. Okay, let's do something. Not like no. that. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly Not what it those is. Those people. Not that way. <laughs> when we, when you asked for us to help. We're helping. We don't like the way you're helping. <laughs> I see that there is no pleasing you. No. And then um, as we're talking about uh, Smoking you know, carbon, a yes, <laughs> carbon pricing as a concept being politically toxic, even in Alberta, where you have the NDP leadership race going on, two of the NDP leadership candidates, uh, Raki Pancholi and uh, Sarah Hoffman, have also came out against carbon pricing, opposing it, with Kathleen Ganley saying support for the pricing scheme is gone. Former Calgary Mayor Nahid Nenshi, who also is in the running, didn't have a comment. And in Manitoba, where there's an NDP Premier, Wap Kano, he too is um, asking uh, for uh, some type of relief in some way, but hasn't joined the other Premiers. Uh, in that letter writing campaign to pressure the federal government. But is, he is on the record as saying he might have, might prefer something else. But hey, he might come up with his own system to make that happen in Manitoba as well. He's not, he's not going the same route as uh, all the premiers that have decided, Justin, do something is their solution. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I did something. But, uh, but, 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 oh, shut up. Just shut the fuck up. Stop complaining. Every time we try and do something, you try and stop us and tell us we haven't done enough. That is the definition of insanity. Indeed. Now, this move from Bronnie Crombie has gotten praise from a very unlikely source, which is uh, Evan Scrimshaw. Yeah, I, I, I saw his, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I did see it. He says, yes, I'm really defending her. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, well, let's read it. Why not? Okay. Do you want me to start? Have you got it? Yeah, it's right in front of me here. Okay, go ahead. In December, one of the last columns I wrote last year was taking Bonnie Crombie out to the woodsheds 
for not having an opinion on whether she supported a carbon tax. In the afterglow of the Ontario Leadership Party leadership race, Ontario Liberal Party leadership race, the lack of defense of a single a signal a single it says signal it should be single I guess yes. liberal achievement angered me. I was wrong. In an ideal world, I'd love Ontario to have a carbon price. I quite like the federal carbon tax as it, as it is designed. If I were a dictator of the world, the carbon tax would be significantly higher. But I'm not yep. a dictator of the world. Alas, and my preferred candidate for the Ontario Liberal leadership lost, so we have to live in reality. And here are a few facts. If you want to take over, sir, I'm going to grab a cup of coffee. <laughs> do you have it with you? Yes, I do. <clears throat> okay, excellent. Um, there is little chance of the federal carbon tax being operative by the time of the next Ontario election. There is almost no chance the Liberals will be governing at the federal level at the time of the next election, and Ontario cannot afford a third Ford term. Would I be happier if Nate were leader? Of course I would. I think Nate will be Premier one day, and I want to make that happen. Nothing I've said about him changes because he lost, and I'm eternally grateful for his campaign. But at the end of the day, it's an abandonment, abandonment of the principles of that campaign to just hand wave away anything Bonnie does as bad because we're still litigating the leadership race. So, is Bonnie abandoning climate action? No. And the progressive left should be far less focused on the policy levers and far more focused on outcomes. The current liberal environmental critic, a Nate endorser, and someone who stood at Queen's Park with Nate to announce his climate policy, is leading a working group slash expert panel slash advisory panel to put together a climate policy that doesn't include a consumer-facing carbon price. This is something that I wanted the Crombie team to do because there was a lot of coherent thinking about climate that doesn't involve a price in the various leadership campaigns' plans. The worry that a lot of people had is that Crombie, who was by her own admission to Nate and my to the right of them, would govern as soft conservative. This carbon tax flip-flop is seen as an admission of it, but when you announce an expert panel led by someone who opposed you in the campaign, it's not really screaming to go it alone. It's what the party needs, which is for Crombie to be the candidate in 2026 of her ambitious on-paper proposals. The weirdest part of the post-signups phase of the campaign was when Bonnie released her housing policy because it was easy to attack but also hard. It was a great plan that went fairly far, at least to my eye, and generally got good marks from the various housing and urbanist people I pay attention to. Her record in Mississauga wasn't good, but the plan on paper was. Ask the average Nate voter about the actual contents of her proposals, and the consensus would have been, they sound great, but... Well, she's now the leader, and at least so far it seems like the party is committed to using the voices who supported others. Does any of this mean that we can all just mindlessly support Bonnie and never question anything she ever does? Fuck no. But it does mean that progressives should view today's twin announcements together. Yes, that they're ditching the carbon tax, but also that they're working together across the party to put together something that rises to the moment. If what that commission slash expert panel slash advisory committee slash whatever the fuck comes back with weak sauce nothingness, then sure, let's go to town on the complaints. I believe in pressuring politicians to do things. I literally wrote a column attacking performative activism this morning that I'm having to somewhat step on that argued in favor of voting uncommitted in the Dem primary down south as a way to move Biden left on Palestine. If Biden does actually abandon the liberal and progressive, sorry, if Bonnie does actually abandon liberal and progressive principles on climate change or any other issue, I'll be at the front of the line to use this megaphone to attack her for this. I will not vote for a conservative or a conservative in liberal red, but that's not what this is. Let's be honest right now. Do you think I want to support Bonnie Crombie? Do you think I'm jazzed about this? Do you know how much easier it would be to run my moral indignation and holier than thou politics till election? She's apparently not running in Milton for what I suspect are reasons I get but find to be unacceptable, that if she loses, her leadership is under immediate threat. This column could be much easier to write and get old anti-Bonnie band back together. But fundamentally, if the goal is to apply pressure to keep the left of the Liberal Party relevant in a Crombie leadership, then we have to be honest. Beating Doug Ford matters more than whatever preference you or I may have about the form of climate action is preferable. What Bonnie Crabbe is doing is tossing overboard not the idea of climate action, but a specific policy lever. This is like saying someone's given up on the idea of weight loss because they hate running outside. Could that be one mechanism to lose some weight? Sure. Are there ways around it? Yes. And is getting rid of a boat anchor of a policy worth having to design new methods of emission reductions? Absolutely. Whatever you think of the carbon tax, the Liberals' complete failure to sell it has meant that people do not believe it is meaningfully reducing emissions. A carbon tax is no longer an emission reduction tool in the eyes of the population, it's a tax increase. And even if the Liberals spend a billion dollars rebranding the rebates and raising awareness 
of it. The other problem that people think it's not actually achieving emission reductions won't be changed. And uh, that is true. And as uh, you might know that the liberals uh, recently rebranded the carbon incentive refund as being the carbon uh, rebate plan. A little late. It's probably what they should have called it at the first yeah. <laughs> to begin with. Well, the and, and they actually should have actually sent physical checks yes. rather than direct deposit at first. Yes, it would have cost more. Yes, we have been using government resources for self-promotion, mm -hmm. but they still should have done it because a physical, physical tangible check in your hand arriving four times a year, which is the other thing they should have done at first because it was only once a year on your tax refund. Had those decisions been made from the get-go, well, now, I understand why you make them, because as soon as they would have made them, conservatives would have been crying, oh, my God, I can't believe you're using money to do that. Yeah. yeah. Like, sting money to do that. But trust me, it would have been a much smaller political hit that you used government money to issue actual physical checks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> than not being able to brand a regulatory fee other than a regulatory fee. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah, and I think they uh, they looked at the trees and forgot the forest when they made those decisions here. Hmm. Well, the next it, the next paragraph. I, yes, I don't know if it really translates well to the average Canadian because oh, these are uh, Australian politicians, and I I don't know nearly enough to make a single comment on this next paragraph. So I don't know about their program. I don't know any of the people he's talking about. So I don't know how well that'll translate for the audience. But okay. But it says here, in Australia, we saw the same thing happen with Julia Gillard's famed carbon tax. Because of various things from the spill of Malcolm Turnbull over Kevin Rudd's carbon pollution reduction scheme and the rolling of Rudd to, Gilliard, to Gillard, ruling out a tax and then passing one, the concept of a carbon price is dead in Australia. And there's plenty still being done by the new Albanese government there from consumer incentives, consumer incentives for EVs to emissions caps for industry and increasing renewables. It's not all or nothing. What we cannot let happen is the carbon tax come to define climate action. If the left lets the narrative come to be that the only way you care about the climate is through support for this one lever, then we're all fucked, and Doug Ford will win 90 seats next time. Is that acceptable to anyone who reads this site? Because it's not to me. Crombie didn't sell out progressives today. She avoided dying on a hill in the name of purity. If and when she falters, I'll be first in line to criticize her. But today, Bonnie took a step to defeating Doug Ford, and for that, I am grateful. I think Dan's comment here is pretty interesting, too. The only person with the power to take out Ford is Merritt Stiles, yet no one talks about her. You got a point. Uh, Merritt Stiles is the leader of the uh, Ontario NDP, and she's a damn good leader and a good person. And I, you know, I, I think she'd make a good premier, to be honest with you, because I don't, I don't, not that I trust any politician per se, but I really don't trust Bonnie Crombie. Mm. I think she's a blue Tory, a, a blue, <laughs> a blue grit, blue, liberal. blue yeah. grit, you know, <clears throat> she's not, and she's, uh, I don't know. I just, I don't trust her. I get a vibe from her that I don't, it's, you know, when they say go with your gut, I'm going with my gut on this one. I don't trust her. I don't trust that she's any different than Dalton McGinty was. Mm. And, and he he was a liberal by name only. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying he was a terrible human being, but a lot of the things he did were very very conservative leaning and not progressive. He made some progressive policies. He did some progressive things, yes, but some of the other things he did were crooked and greasy. And yeah, mm. and I mean he 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 was the first guy to, you know, we changed the rules. We used to be able to go and get your eyes tested. Oh, hip covered it. Not anymore. Now it's 120 bucks. It used to be 80. Now it's 120. And I think it's going up again. He, he cut funding for that. Now, if you're over a certain age, I think if you're 65 or older or 18 or younger, oh, hip still covers it. But that middle ground, we got to pay. All right, fine. Okay. But why did you cut that? Why did you cut the funding for that? And he cut medical or healthcare funding by a few billion dollars. Well, he also brought in the health tax, uh, the yeah. health cost premium, which was the largest one-time tax increase in Ontario history. Exactly. So, the, you know, I don't think Bonnie Crombie is any different than Dalton McGinty. That's why it's, you know, let's give Merritt Stiles a shot. Let's see hmm. if she can, let's see if she can do to Ontario what Wab Canoe is doing in Manitoba. And even Wab Canoe's detractors are going, well, he's doing everything he said he would. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You can't get yeah. mad at somebody hey. who follows through on their promises. There's and, a lot of people who voted for Mike Harris the second time in Ontario for that very reason. It's like, you know what? I don't like what he's doing, but he did what he said he promised in this first term. So yeah. he's getting my vote. And, and I know a lot of people who did that. He did what he said he was going to do. Now, what I didn't understand was the, the, the cuts he made were to the most vulnerable members of society. And I didn't get that the first time around. Because I wasn't as politically engaged then as I am today. Mostly because I was working 80 hours a week, but the eight hours a week I was at, you know, full time on construction sites, not not 40 of this and 40 of my day job. You mm. know? So it's hard to be, fu- which is, you know, why we have a show. We're trying to get information to people who don't have the time to digest it. And we understand that. That's why we have an audio only version of our podcast, as well as our live YouTube stream and the YouTube stream repeat. That's the reason for it, because we understand that people are working two, sometimes three jobs just to make ends meet. Yep, and if people you're, are on the go. People are on the go. And when you get a little bit of, of free time, you might want to use that for something leisurely. So I understand it. I really do, because I'm no different than you. I work mm. a lot. Mm. I get it. Mm. <clears throat> Yesterday I got back in from rehearsal and I knew, I knew I had to do some stuff to prepare the show and it was sort of like, but all I want to do is watch the Women's World Curling Championships. Mm. Yeah, my brain is fried. I'm tired. I'm pooped. We just watched, <laughs> we watched a couple of uh, stand-up comedy specials last night. One with Ryan Hamilton. Um, happy face or funny face. It, it was really funny actually. And then the other one was Catherine Ryan from a few years ago uh, in the UK. And she's from Sarnia, Ontario and she's Really funny, but if you're slightly sensitive, you might not like her. <laughs> okay. Um, speaking of other climate stuff, um, because when we're talking about the carbon prices and the federal initiatives, uh, according to MP Adam Vancouverden, um, there are about 50 countries in the world who are using carbon pricing as part of their climate strategy. And in Canada, we have indeed reduced our emissions since 2005. And uh, we have uh, commitments to lower emissions by 40 to 45% from 2005 levels. That's good. There are 10 sectors that are being measured in Canada. The only sector in Canada that still has their emissions going up rather than down is the oil and gas sector, which is one of the reasons for the uh, emissions cap that the federal government is uh, looking to bring in because essentially it's like, listen, you know, We've started on this with all other sectors like about eight years ago and everybody else has managed to uh, contribute to the decreasing of our annual uh, emissions, except you guys. So now now you've had you've had an extra eight years of partying. Mm-hmm. It's time for you to become in line now. <laughs> and um, we've also received more information. Um, the first one is that... Uh, Last year, due to the wildfires, Canada lost its status as having the cleanest air quality in North America. Uh, there's a latest report by global air quality, on global air quality produced by IQ Air that indicates that in 2023, Canada's numbers uh, were double that which is considered safe by the World Health Organization. Um, the organization measured uh, what's called PM2.5 particulate, and that's the pollutant that kills the most amount of people on this planet. And um, PM2.5 particulate can affect the lungs, the brain, and the heart. So uh, due to the wildfires that we had last summer, uh, we basically went from first to worst in North America. Only seven of the 130 countries monitored had an air quality that was considered to be safe, among them Australia, New Zealand, and Finland, and Bangladesh was the country with the worst air quality reported. Um, In addition to this, climate scientists have said that Canada has experienced its warmest winter in 77 years of record-keeping. Winter ends early tonight in most of Canada or Mm -hmm. uh, early tomorrow morning if you live on the East Coast. And Environment Canada says that from December to February, Canada was 5.2 degrees Celsius warmer than normal and 1.1 degrees Celsius warmer than the warmest ever recorded, which was 14 years ago. Yeah, and I remember that one. That was a that was a doozy. Yeah, that, this was a very very mild winter. We hardly had any snow this year. Outdoor rinks were open and closed periodically because it was so mild most of the time. I didn't get skiing once this year. I got out five times last year, and last year was not a very good season. 
Mm. Now the canal did open for 10 days this year, but it was still less snow and milder, if you ask me, compared to the previous. How yeah. they got the canal open at all is beyond me. I mean, that's yeah. some kind of science magic, that. Yeah. And when we're talking about that, you know, it, it, like it's having real effects in the province of British Columbia. Oh, and, yes. uh, I think Premier David Eby just announced uh, $80 million to help the province collect, store, and manage water for livestock and crops. Because uh, along with uh, Bowen Ma, the British Columbia Minister of Emergency Management and Climate Readiness, because there has not been enough rain or snow mm -hmm. so far. So, uh, yeah, we're spending money now on storing water and collecting mm -hmm. water That's because it's not scary. coming down plenty enough. Yeah. That's a little scary. I, 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 I've still always been surprised that we don't we didn't have a system of national pipelines and underground reservoirs for this because we have all started the built in long. The yeah, started to build like a long time ago, um, but apparently yeah. nobody thought that we should get on that at some point. Well, I think they're wondering about it now. I have another scary stat for you. Okay, this is really disturbing, um, and it's going to be a bit of a hot button hot button issue, but. It's disturbing. And a lot of our, our viewers and listeners are in our age range, so they'll probably have the same reaction I do to this. In Peel region, the number of seven-year-olds considered fully vaccinated against measles went from 77% in 2020 to 39% in 2022. If your children are not vaccinated, this leaves them at great risk. Talk with your doctor about how to best protect your family. One of the things that, that measles can lead to is uh, measles encephalitis and um, that's lights out. If if your child gets measles encephalitis, um, kiss them goodbye because they can't do anything to help. And if they can, by some miracle, save their life, it's never going to be the same. So get your kids vaccinated. We eradicated smallpox through vaccination. We could eradicate measles too. I'm not telling you how to raise your kids. I'm telling you how to protect people. One person with measles can spread it from 12 to 18 people before they even know they're sick. Yeah. Yeah. According to the CBC, Canada's heading towards a major measles outbreak without vaccine boost. According to some modeling, this came out on the 16th. This is uh, about so three days ago. Um, seems that uh, as of Friday, at least 31 cases of measles have been reported so far this year across Canada. Um, I believe in Ontario specifically, uh, they reported on the 14th that there are more measles cases reported in Ontario in 2024 than in all of previous years. Mm -hmm. Now, it makes me wonder now, I, I, I've had my MMR, MMR, you know what I mean? <laughs> MMR. Yes. Measles, mumps, and rubella. Thank you. I've had that vaccination, but that was a long time ago. I'm wondering if I should, if, is there a booster available for that recently? I don't, I don't know. It's like, I'm well, literally calling it into question. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's find out here. Maybe this article will, will say so. Because um, if it's starting to spread and I'm at risk because I haven't had it since what, 1972 or 71 or whatever it was. Yeah. So the 31 cases of measles reported this year is already the largest annual total since 2019 and more than double the number of cases reported last year. And uh, they say that the, the numbers will rise as some more Canadians travel. New projections from a team at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia show the grim possibilities. The modeling suggests that vaccine coverage of less than 85% can lead to dozens of cases within small communities or even hundreds if immunization rates are lower. As you mentioned, uh, Mr. Grizzly, the modeling identified one example scenario in a 1,000 person community with a 75% vaccination level, as slower public health efforts to track and isolate cases, a measles outbreak could grow to a median size of 100 or so people. So basically 10% of the population. That would mean roughly 20 hospitalizations based on typical rates of severe disease from this highly contagious infection, which can lead to serious complications such as pneumonia, brain inflammation, and death, as you mentioned, the encephalitis, Except the brain worries. inflammation. Uh, and uh, measles is uh, one of the most communicable diseases out there. Oh, yes. It's possible. And in an 8,000-person community with a 60% vaccination coverage, for example, the team estimated there would be about 1,000 cases. If the vaccination rate was only 55%, the outbreak could hit nearly 3,000 cases. So um, um, 
they're not in direct proportion. The more the level of immunization goes down, the greater, uh, and by a lot, mm -hmm. uh, the number of potential cases. And it seems that um, uh, there's some community, Canadian communities where uptake rates are far lower than 55% at the moment. Uh, the worst case scenario is that measles outbreaks aren't contained at all, warned researcher Carolyn Colian, an epidemiologist and mathematician at Simon Fraser University in Burner, BBC, who helped prepare the study. Quote, Canada could even lose its elimination status for measles, which it's had since 1998. So far, the cases in Canada reported are 21 in Quebec, 8 in Ontario, 1 in British Columbia, and 1 in Saskatchewan. Um, Montreal area is considered an early hot spot uh, for one of those 21 cases. Uh, and uh, overall, the article says, while the overall vaccination rates in Quebec remain high, Boileau, who is uh, Dr. Luc Boileau, who's Quebec's public health director, stressed that there are some schools in the Montreal area where uptake for the measles vaccine is far lower, falling below 50, 40, and even 30%. Wow. There's a lot of kids that did not get Im Im immunized uh, during the COVID break. Um, in some cases, uh, let's see, what do we got? Po pockets of low vaccination. Yeah, there we go. Canada's overall MMR vaccination rate is also falling and it hit a low point mid pandemic. The latest available data suggests in 2021, the year after the pandemic was declared, only 79% of children had two doses by their seventh birthday, meaning two kids in 10 weren't fully up to date on their shots. That's down from 87% just four years earlier. So an almost 10% drop in the space of four years. Uh, and that these are people, children fully vaccinated for measles by their seventh birthday. The well, goal this... is to, to reach 95% right. by 2025. We hadn't reached that in 2013. We are at 85.7% at 2017 is the closest we got. We got to 87% vaccination rate, but the goal is 95 but now we slipped down to just under 80 at 79.2. What's more important, Simon uh, Fraser University, uh, Colian stressed, is the viability of that coverage within different communities. In Alberta, for example, 75% of all children up to age 7 had both doses of the MMR vaccine, according to a provincial database, but the same data broken down by region shows vast disparities in uptakes. In many areas, including neighborhoods in Calgary, the vaccination rate was above 80%, while more than 100 communities fell below that level, including several with uptake below 50%. The county of Two Hills, a 3,000-person municipality in northeastern Alberta, had the province's lowest MMR vaccination rate for children at just 32%. So there's not equal risk to all Canadians uh, at the moment. Uh, the risk depends on where you live. Uh, according to the spokesperson for the Public Health Agency of Canada, um, says that it's working with provinces and territories to monitor measles cases nationally. The agency also agreed that modeling conducted by Canadian universities suggests that outbreaks are likely if an infected individual brings an infection into schools or communities where vaccine coverage isn't higher, isn't high enough. Uh, and this is following a situation that is happening in Europe. They're seeing uh, similar things here going going on there. Um, uh, because and in the United States as well, uh, there's 58 cases reported across 17 states as of March 14th. There, and uh, let's see, uh, in the European region, with a 45-fold increase in cases across the area between 2002 and 2023, the region, which includes 53 member states in Europe and Central Asia, Asia reported nearly 60,000 total infections last year, resulting in thousands of hospitalizations and 10 measles-related deaths. McGill University's ward says he expect. Uh, sorry, McGill University says that they expect uh, the U.S. will eventually hit that level of infections, with Canada not far behind. Uh, and the article doesn't say anything about uh, vaccinations. So, uh, but I will make sure to look at the. I look up that information and have it on a, a on a subsequent show, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Grizzly, to see if uh, what the uh, NASI might be recommending with regard to, to vaccinations for measles. Yeah, a lot of people in the chat are saying I should be fine, but I still, you know, I, I want to be safe. I don't want to get anybody else sick either. You, it's one of the least. Uh, uh, one of the safest vaccines that there are. So there's, oh, yes. if, if you are not sure, 
you just go there's, and get it. there's just go and get a booster that I, yeah. I remember hearing on the radio uh that when, uh, when they were talking about that uh whether or not you should get another dose you will not hurt yourself mm-hmm. if you're a grown up if you're not sure if you've lost your vaccine vaccination records from all you know moving or all that kind of stuff that happens mm-hmm. when we're kid because we don't control our own vaccination cards when we're kids no right it's our parents not. that do well ours for example we lost our original ones in a fire well, uh, and when I, when I, I moved young. so many times i I don't know if I would still have mine. Like I personally don't. I'd, I'd have to ask my mom, and and she probably has them somewhere. But we moved a lot, military kids, right? So right. Sometimes that's difficult. I mean, now we can get electronic copies of everything, thankfully, which makes it things you know things are easy in that sense. Um, and I can show you. You know, I've had six COVID shots, and I'll get my seventh when due in the spring because I'm told that they're coming out with a new booster, and I'm like, yep. I'm happy to get it. I don't want to get sick, right? And I don't want to get other people sick. And that 5G chip is not improving the speed on my phone. If anything, it's slowed down. So, God damn it. Well, that's because all of us got it. Oh, so we're all on the 5G now. So we've slowed it down. That's why. We're all on the same network. What What, what was I thinking? <laughs> hey. No, that's a joke. By the way, YouTube <laughs> will, will flag this for some bizarre reason. It's a joke. There's no 5G chip. Get your vaccinations. All of them. All of them. Yes, all of them. Oh, gee. Uh, how much time do we have, Mr. Grizzly? We should start wrapping up. I got to get into the office. I got a really big day ahead. Okay. And, uh, uh, then I, just I, have to... a, I have a clip for you here. Of, okay. Of, of Michelle getting called out in the house. The oh, okay. We talked about earlier. Yes. I will. Uh, I'll put this on the screen because I, I think. I think. Everyone will enjoy this as much as I did. So this is Michelle Ferrari getting called out for being a duplicitous individual. After eight years of this liberal NDP coalition, food has never been more... Okay, she lied right off the hop. Mm -hmm. After eight years of this liberal NDP coalition, okay, it's not a coalition, number one, it's a supply and confidence agreement, number two, and it's two years old, not eight. So she can't even start without lying expensive in fact food is so unaffordable that 50 active serving military families from cfb gagetown are using the oral mukto food bank this is outrageous it is shocking and it is unacceptable so for the hundredth time on behalf of all the canadians and 70 percent of the premiers in this country will they spike the hike axe the tax and make food more affordable The Honourable Minister uh, for National Defence. Mr. Speaker, that's an extraordinary comment, and I, I'd like to commend the member for being able to say with a straight face. Because the fact is, Mr. Speaker, we gave members of the Canadian Armed Forces a very significant raise just last year. And when it came before this House to vote for the money for that raise, every single Conservative on that side of the House oh voted against it. Mr. Speaker, perhaps they should scrap the crown. Shame. Mm-hmm. Scrap the crap. What are you going to do to help these people? Well, we voted to give them a raise in December, and you voted against it. And you guys also voted uh, when you were in government to give them a lump sum payment so you could be done with them. Yeah, yeah. Because you see them as human capital and nothing more. I mean, the arrogance of that. Yeah. The arrogance of that, of saying that wrapping herself in the flag and claiming she cares about veterans, which is from the party that gave them a lump sum payment to try to get rid of them, and now well, saying... And let's not forget the, the individual that, that Rick, uh, Rick Mercer's friend who each year has to reapply yes. for, for funding because his legs did not grow back after he lost them stepping on a landmine in Afghanistan. He has to reapply every year to prove that he doesn't have legs. We're in bizarro world. Jeez. Um, before we go, uh, for those who are wondering, um, the 18th Prime Minister of Canada, Brian Mulroney, who passed away on February 29th at the age of 84. Uh, his casket will arrive uh, in Ottawa today 
and uh, we'll stay there today and tomorrow so that the public can come and pay their respects. He'll be lying in state uh, from 12.30 to 6 o'clock today for the people to come and pay their last respects. I'm not sure if it will be the same times tomorrow, but I assume it will be 12.30 mm -hmm. to 6. Um, and then on uh, Wednesday, it uh, will be going to Montreal to lie in repose at St. Patrick's Basilica. Uh, and we'll be there Thursday and Friday for people to come and pay their respects there, I believe. And then the funeral, the state funeral, will be held Saturday in Montreal at Notre Dame Basilica. Uh, CPAC will air the ceremony. I assume the national news networks will order them as well, uh, will air it as well. And uh, yesterday in the House of uh, Commons, uh, his widow Mila, his children Nicholas, Mark, Ben, and Caroline were in the House of Commons to hear MPs pay tribute to him. Um, so that's been what's been uh, going on. Uh, I am, uh, you know, well, most of the people said the, the, the standard stuff. Um, you could tell uh, if you were listening to, them, them, that, listening to them that Pierre Polyev didn't really have much to say mm -hmm. or much experience with him, really. Um, yeah, it seems that the main crux of his uh, comments was to compliment uh, Mila for having been the force uh, you know, who kept things steady and that type of stuff, which, you know, is a nice thing to say, but it's also the thing that you say when you have no personal experience or mm -hmm. haven't bothered to do the research or Well, he's not out. invited to the funeral either. No, he's not. He's not invited. Uh, but uh, the response that I'm more, more interested in listening to, and I hope we'll have clips for you tomorrow, is the one from Elizabeth May, who did work for Brian mm. Mulroney for two right. years. Um, so um, that's the one I'm going to be uh, listening to uh, today to pay attention to and uh, bring something to you. But uh, you can find it uh, on the web uh, very easily. She spoke for about uh, just under 12 minutes okay. uh, in the house about that. So I, I, I will be reading that. But uh, if you happen to be living in Ottawa or in the Montreal area and you wanted to make a point of paying your respects in person, um, it will be lying in the state in Ottawa. I'm guessing that happens on the hill. I would assume in West Block, which is now House of Commons because of the fact that uh, Center Block is under construction for about seven or eight more years. Yeah. Um, so uh, between 12.30 and 6 today and uh, Thursday and Friday, St. Patrick's Basilica in Montreal with the funeral on Saturday. Sunday? All right. Saturday or Sunday? Uh, the funeral will be on Saturday. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, do we have a show? We do indeed, sir. All right, kids and cops, and that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you, 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 you. <laughs> Little barbershop for you. Ah, uh, because sharing is caring. I'll sing the bass. Oh, Michael, 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 Kit Michael. A little premature with the cue the cock. What's <laughs> your... <laughs> That was a premature enunciation. Yep. Um, <laughs> um, because sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. And you have the mouse for which we want the words to come. If you scan that QR code, <laughs> story of my life, he says. <laughs> oh, dude. Uh, uh, I love it when we joke and the kids roll with it. <laughs> <laughs> Set and smash. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, you do not have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl who sponsored our pod page site. So if you scan that QR code right under my chin, that will bring you to our pod page page that's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of them and when we have something fresh off the bandwidth it will come directly to you there you go and if you'd like to support us in other ways there's kit elaine right on time thank you my dear have a beyond awesome day everyone remember to smash the button before you leave and if you want to smash that button all you have to do is go to the true north eager beaver media youtube page and there like share and subscribe are waiting for you smash them click them tweak them anything lick them we like it we like it. Uh, Ms. Shattuck says, says, good morning, and wants me to remind you that he wants to be on the show again one day. I did see the comment yesterday. I did, I did, and yes, you can tell Mateo that we will definitely have him on to say good morning again. Please give him a very, very, very big hug from all of us. All the damn fam. Big collective hug. 
<laughs> and if you would like to support us in other ways, you can do that via our coffee page. That's where you will find the Beaver Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund. So you scan that QR code by Mr. Grizzly's head there. <laughs> I licked the button and the cowboy liked it. <laughs> I lick the button. I liked it. <laughs> well, that's yeah, sure. Why not? Why not? <laughs> so yes, if you go to our coffee page, that's coffee k o hyphen f i dot com slash eager beaver lowercase letters, all in one word. You can make a little contribution to our hydration fund, where our friends Guinness Coffee Caesar and Hot Chocolate are waiting for us to help us write, produce, market deliver this entire show to you and uh we appreciate every donation thank you so very much but once again the gift of your attention is the most important one if you would like to write to us our email address is true north eager beaver at gmail.com if you're listening on apple please give us some stars and reviews it helps people to find us it helps get us on the charts all that good stuff we really appreciate that because democracy is something that you do sorry <clears throat> hold on you're gonna don't don't die on me now. Yeah, a little froggy in my throat, because democracy is something that you do. Uh, please write those letters. Very, very, very important. And uh, I've heard somewhere, and I don't know if Kit Dan is there today. Yes, he is. Um, it seems that uh, Kit Angela's efforts in Hamilton have been yielding some results. Oh. In that, it seems that she is finally going to get, uh, I guess, an audience or a meeting with the mayor, Andrea Horvath, to oh, discuss certain things. So after pretending that they were not there and then sending the police to dismantle the camps and all the other stuff, uh, Wednesday morning meetings. So there we go. Uh, they've managed to, to persistence pays off. Yes, it does. Make yourself a thorn in someone's side. Yeah. Eventually, do, yeah, eventually you do what you got to do, but you will get the grease. And see, the whole police, whole protest was polite and legal and respectful. Mm -hmm. He just had to push it to the point where they can't ignore you anymore. And it wasn't like the Ottawa occupation. They didn't take a whole city hostage. Yeah. They protested in the ways that they were allowed to protest and could protest and created a situation where the PR hit being taken was enough that they finally got the meeting. They didn't harm anyone in the process. That's how you protest. Indeed. Loudmouths take notes. All right. This Mr. is how you do it. Boom, 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 boom. This is how we protest, yeah. Mm. Uh, 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 uh. Mr. Grizzly crew the cock. Boom. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. And uh, I don't know if you have anything for the Easter egg, Mr. Grizzly? Something quick. Um, if you okay. are a fan of electronic music or house music or dance music or DJ house culture. House music all night long. House music all night long. Tomorrowland Winter is uh, taking place over the next few days uh, where they take over a mountain and have a giant rave <gasps> outside in the snow. Yeah, Tomorrowland Winter. Uh, it's at, uh, where is it? Alpe de Ways. It's in France. It's taking place ah. in France. In the Alps, in the French Alps. Darn. Tomorrowland Winter is the hashtag. You can find it on the Twitter. Uh, March 18th to the 25th, 2023. It must be 2024 because everybody's talking about it right now online. Yeah, immersing festival visitors in the stunning scenery of Tomorrowland Winter. 
So yeah, they've got uh, a really cool setup. Um, I'll show you a couple pictures here, just so you know. And, Road trip. Uh, well, I'd love to go to France oh. right now, but you know, it's, it's time and money. Two things I'd I love to go to a rave. I haven't been dancing in so long. Yeah, I know. I know. So here's a couple of photos. There's, uh, they've got like a giant. I don't know, Phoenix. I guess it is. I don't know. You tell me. Uh, then there's the nighttime thing, and then there's uh, a lady raven. And uh, I don't know what that is, but it's really cool. So, yeah, Tomorrowland Winter taking place right now in France. Uh, if you're a fan of EDM or dance music or house music or DJ culture or rave culture, whatever you want, whatever label you want to put on it, be cool to go check that out if you can. I certainly can't because, you know, I have to stay here and earn a living. Ah, oh, darn. I can't get there and get back in time for tomorrow's show. No, Darn. no, no. Encore <laughs> doesn't fly anymore, so that isn't going to happen. <laughs> um, just a couple of notes for you. Uh, the um, inflation numbers are due to come out today, so watch for that. That will be some big news. And uh, yesterday, uh, the vote did take place on the NDP motion uh, with regard uh, to uh, Gaza. And uh, while we have a story on that, we didn't have time to fit it in today, so I will have it uh, for you tomorrow. All right, so it's okay. not that we forgot about it. It's just that we didn't have time today. All right, kiss and cups. Mwah. Big kisses and hugs. Have a great day. I'll see you. Sorry, have a beaverific day. You are listening to